Okay, talking about cold red. It's a matter of your gut feeling. It's a matter of time. It's a matter of vital signs and additional findings and your interpretation of that. And it's a whole bundle of interventions yet to be proven to be effective. Not proven evidence base, but taken together may make a whole of a difference. And this is the manual. He just fell down 12 meters from this working platform. So you're approaching the scene. What's your feeling about that? He is still responsive, a little dizzy, complaining about chest and shoulder pain. So the whole issue about code red is something in between your estimated time of arrival and his estimated time of death. You may narrow or widen the gap in between and gain what he needs most time. And awaiting Emmanuel to bleed to death is short, maybe less than two hours, something in between. We got some data on this end. So this is what he needs, nothing else. And there's new data on the side that you lose maybe 60% of all your patients just on the spot. And what I didn't tell you, the other person working with Emmanuel on this working platform, he was just dead on scene. And you may save an additional 30% in the first hour. And the Dutch colleagues, they phrased that the most exciting moment, the most exciting hour is one hour after hospital admission. And that's what we may see on the first side. Doesn't look so bad. Time to take a coffee again, make my work back in my office. No, it's not. It's just a question of science. And that's the science you get. And even if you see a systolic blood pressure below 100, mortality rates doubles. If it goes below 70, it goes up five to six times. And the consequence is straightforward. Whenever you see a patient with a blood pressure below 110, go for a cold red procedure. But is blood pressure all? Does it tell the story? No, we got more data right now. It's loss of consciousness indicated by the Glasgow Coma Scale. It's shock, it's acidosis, it's cholepathy, and it's finally aged, so I turn out pretty bad, I'm afraid. And that's where you're heading at, at this very time point where shock may be reversible or not. You have to hit it sharp. Don't shoot too far, too far to the right, otherwise you lose your patient. Code red is about fluids. Right selections, right timings, and disappointing. Cochrane analysis indicates there's continuing uncertainty about the best fluid administration strategy in bleeding trauma patients. This hasn't changed for decades. We don't know what to infuse, when, how much. Second is true, if we go for another approach, go for vasopressor drugs, be cautious. It may fail also, regardless what kind you use. So my answer is straightforward. If you've got two tools, not proven effective, maybe harmful, combine them and get the best of both. <laughs> but where's the future? I think Code Red is now about hemostatic resuscitation. And we got more data on this end, and we are working pretty hard to show the world that this is a working concept. So your plasma fibrinogen levels should be as high as 1.5 to 2 grams per liter. You assess this stuff with rotem, rotational thromboelastometry. And what you see on the side here is a bleeding patient with a fibtem far below. And you should infuse fibrinogen concentrates, 25 to 50 milligrams per kilogram body weight, or tranexamic acid, and things may look better afterwards. This has been proven effective in the FinTech trial, Fibrinogen in Trauma-Induced Cogalopathy, run by Dietmar Fries from Innsbruck University Hospital, and we have been one center site, really showing that clot stability and clot stability improved FIPTEM was 
available at hospital admission. Code red is about massive transfusion. And it looks like this is the solution of all problems, pouring blood in, but it's also part of the problem. Ah, move forward. Start the engine, please. OK. It's about mortality and transfusion. And what a surprise. The more blood you need, the higher the mortality is going to be. Not talking about side effects on the long-term run. But we got better data right now on the first side, at admission at the hospital, when to prepare for massive transfusion. And this may either the base deficit with higher expectancy of needs for massive transfusion if it's above 10 or 6 to 10, minus notably, or with a fibrin again. If it's really flattening out, you have a higher risk ratio that you need blood. And that's the European Code Red guideline. Coagulation factors first. Hemostatic resuscitation on first spot. Plasma or fibrinogen. Second, go for the optimal fresh frozen and RBC ratios. And finally, don't add further drugs without substantial bleeding. You may harm. That's not only the solution of the problem, it's part of the problem. And finally, one orphan child, often to be forgotten, that is, don't make any mistakes in ventilation. Any increase in intrathoracic pressure derived by positive pressure ventilation is going to lower your cardiac output. So skip away of PEEP or keep it low and decrease your respiratory rate in shock. And this is a nice groundbreaking paper, I think, from Pepe et al. showing this. So taking together Code Red is a target therapy bundle. It's time to damage control, and we have to link together pre-hospital care and in-hospital top-notch work in order to save lives. It's a story about fluids and vasopressor drugs, but it is and there's a future of hemostatic resuscitation. It's feasible out there. It's feasible when done and provided by helicopter crews. It's a story about advanced ventilation and even for ECMO. And that's what Emmanuel was needing. He needed not only surgery, removal of his scattered spleen, but by lobectomy due to the severe thoracic trauma. He needed ECMO for five days, but he's now graduating from university. So it took 35 minutes to save 70 years of lifespan. Thanks, Fox. Hmm? Am I changing it? Okay, Knight Rider and Kit. What do you All want right, to watch guys. Next, so, definitely a theme here. We have mm. a brilliant intellectual and skeptical audience, which we absolutely love because we have to question the evidence. So, Wolfgang, the people said you presented excellent case reports, the physiology seems to make sense. But where are the randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials that definitively show that pre-hospital blood changes outcomes in sick trauma patients? The people want to know. They said that in 140 characters? 140 characters. <laughs> <laughs> so this is off records. Fuck the evidence. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> We will never be able to set up trials really comparable. And if every one of you would jump out from this fourth floor down in this yard, we may have somebody who isn't injured at all and somebody who may be dead on scene, and somebody who may respond very easily and somebody who is under deep, deep, deep shock. So we cannot compare apple and peaches. We will not be able to gather data, and especially legal authorities, they're going to screw us. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Wolfgang, the people also want to know, you presented uh, great physiology. Could you review a little bit why exactly we don't want PEEP in trauma patients? And um, why are we not using additional medications like vasopressors, if you could review the okay. physiology? Um, first answer is, why no PEEP? So every time you increase intrathoracic pressure, you limit venous backflow of blood to the heart. So it's quite obvious. This has been known since introduction of intermittent positive pressure ventilation. And especially in shock situations, you have to be aware of that. 
Second is vasopressors. I strongly believe in vasopressor drugs. It was just showing your paper here on this side. But not only on this aspect, it has to be combined. And our physiologic response to hemorrhagic shock is an increase in perfusion pressure by provoking and sending out hormones, vasoconstrictive triggers. That's it. Okay, I think we're out of time. Thank you, Wolfgang. <coughs> Great talk.